So I'm trying to get around the world and educate myself about enterprise systems uh, that are getting ready for the age of context. How do we deal with the coming data flows? You know, last night I had uh, dinner with the vice president of uh, marketing at the Ritz, and I said, you're going to need to know 100 times more about your customers than you do today, and he agreed. So how do we get ready, ready for that world? Where, well, Scale-Out uh, Software is building an in-memory uh, compute system uh, that's quite interesting, and a lot of big companies are using it, so I wanted to learn about it right now. Who are you? I'm Bill Bain. I'm the founder and CEO of Scale-Out Software, and I'm an inveterate entrepreneur, and this is my fourth company. So my background is in parallel computing, going back to my days in graduate school. And I've worked at several companies, including Intel Supercomputer Systems, Bell Laboratories, and more recently, I did a company that was acquired by Microsoft. And in each of these companies, I worked on parallel computing techniques, in particular, the use of memory spread across a cluster of servers to accelerate processing. And that's uh, the genesis of the technology technology that's in scale-out software. And that's why we're interested in what you're doing, because yeah. uh, we are uh, now seeing data, cen data centers where there's all SSD. All of our data centers now are going SSD. And uh, we're seeing new kinds of workloads, and, and we're seeing new demands. I mean, I, I talk about the Ritz-Carlton. They're going to see 100 times more data about their customers coming than they have today. And that's uh, going to put more um, demands on on technologies like the ones you're developing, right? Absolutely, in fact, it, it's the use of data that's changing in real time, the kind of data that Ritz-Carlton might be receiving in real time that has to be analyzed so that they can be as competitive as possible in offering the best services to their customers and responding to problems that might come up. So you can use this kind of technology not only in customer-facing applications like web services, but also in the back office, for example, in monitoring the systems within hotels to make sure the temperatures and everything and the security is running correctly in real time and, and be able to react to problems as they occur. Yeah. Tell me about this space, because I have no clue about your competitors or what somebody, a CTO, would evaluate when, when they need your kind of uh, technology. Well, let me tell you a little story. And first of all, let me thank you for uh, inviting us today. It's a real pleasure to be with you. Uh, the story starts back in the 80s when people first started using data parallel computing techniques in order to accelerate processing. And people learn that you can spread computations across a cluster or a set of servers, whether it's special purpose hardware, as we had in the old days uh, from Intel and also before that with thinking machines. You may have heard of the connection machine yeah. from Danny Hillis. Well, this technology has evolved for three decades, four decades now. And uh, at the time, Moore's Law was in full force. And so processor speeds were growing so fast that parallel computing stayed in its infancy. But in, at the turn of uh, uh, the millennium, we started to see Moore's Law tapering off and the advances in uh, processor speed slowing down. So now, the use of parallel computing techniques has become even more important. And we're seeing clusters and cloud computing yeah. deployed in order to speed up processing and deliver results as quickly as possible. Yeah, and we're certainly seeing that in our data centers. You have a 100,000 uh, machines right. with five, uh, four cores or six cores or eight cores on them, all with SSD, and you're going to spread workloads across many, many machines, right? That's right. Um, and that's quite different than having a mainframe. Absolutely. <laughs> it lets us scale out, and I guess, I guess that's where you, uh, I, I got attracted to you because your name is Scale Out. So that's you're right. actually building systems for this new right. uh, uh, world where you're going to spread out over many, many machines. Right. I first saw that word scale out used at Microsoft and it was in the public domain and I thought it would be a good term so the people would understand we're talking about scaling out computation across servers as opposed to scaling up computation by getting a larger server or maybe a multi-processor server with more processors or cores. Yeah. This certainly matters in the cloud computing world because if you come to Rackspace Cloud and you just start uh, you know, you opening up your iPad and you say, right. I need 15 more servers, right. and it's really an instance, it's a virtualized server. Right? Well, cloud computing, uh, uh, companies like Rackspace are a dream come true for parallel computing, because now we can have the hardware we need on demand to perform these computations, whereas in the, a decade ago, you had to have the capital expense to have the servers in-house. 
and so many companies could not really scale out to tens and hundreds of servers. Today, it's a routine thing to do. Yeah. So, the, the, who buys your stuff? Is is, is uh, well, well, you give me some names, but I, I don't want to okay. uh, blow that because <laughs> <So, laughs> well, I don't know which ones are approved to talk about. Well, them. first of all, let me explain that scaled out computing. Is, uh, the core of it is in-memory computing. So okay. the problem and the, and the challenge is how do you store data in memory that is distributed across a cluster of computers and make it uniformly accessible to a computation that is distributed across that cluster? That's the key problem. That's the problem people have worked on for decades. And that's the problem that's solved by a class of software called in-memory data grids. And our company produces an in-memory data grid called Scale-Out State Server. And there are other companies, for example, Oracle has coherence and Gigaspaces, Gemfire, Gridgain, there are other companies in our space. Now, on top of that, we have layered real-time analytics so we can take the data that's been distributed across those servers and analyze it, especially as it's changing in real time, so we can discover patterns and trends and feed that back to the users of the system. So a large retailer uh, like a Walmart or something is probably seeing millions of uh, changes every day, right. right? So yes, a classic example going back to 2005 and earlier is to use in-memory data grids to store shopping carts and session, st session state for web farms. And that's really where I got started in this. Um, I did a company that Microsoft acquired and we implemented IP load balancing to distribute workload across a web farm. And the problem was where do you store the session state? Where do you store the shopping carts? And at the time, uh, the database server was used for that. And a database server will quickly bottleneck when you have 20 or 40 web servers. Yeah. And so it's obvious you need to move the data closer to where it's being used and you need to put it in memory so you can access it rapidly, avoid delays. Um, in web hits. So, uh, so in-memory data grids were deployed there to hold shopping carts. So we have customers like Home Shopping Network that use our product to hold shopping carts. In addition, there are applications in financial services, and we can talk about that. Yeah. Uh, and so you help people uh, build faster systems. That's, That's right. really what you're doing. Yeah. And so if somebody's hitting a, uh, one of these bottlenecks, because they're getting so much data in and they aren't able to uh, pull it off a disk anymore quickly enough, they need to start thinking about spreading that database over uh, a cluster of computers and keeping it in SSD, right? Right. In fact, well, or in DRAM. So we, we use DRAM. We think in-memory data grids will evolve in the next couple of years to incorporate SSDs as a transparent part of the offering. The APIs will make use of SSDs to spill data out of DRAM uh, and to hold much larger data sets. Today, a practical upper limit is in the terabytes. But by using SSDs and integrating them in, we can go to the petabytes or higher. Uh, as you would with um, you know, disks today. Right. So let me give you another example. Um, we, we're working with a company that maintains inventory for perishable goods. So they have two siloed database systems, one that's maintaining the inventory and another that's maintaining the orders they flow in. And the problem they have is that orders for perishable goods uh, can uh, order a good that might not actually be there at the time it's needed. And since the goods are perishable, it's a very delicate problem. So the, the orders and the inventory have to be reconciled in real time. Well, how do you do that? Well, it's very hard to take two siloed database systems and do a computation to reconcile a huge uh, a stream of orders flowing in in real time. But in-memory data grids can do that. So that would be a SQL statement, and when you join SQL, databases uh, bottlenecks it, right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so it's better to host that data, to host all of the orders and the inventory, the recent orders, recent inventory, in the in-memory data grid, use a cluster of servers so you have enough uh, storage capacity for, for the data set you need, and then to perform data parallel computation to reconcile the orders against the inventory in real time and deliver answers in seconds instead of doing this job over the course of hours. Yeah, this probably isn't uh, a very inexpensive thing, right? Th this is meant for uh, companies that have s significant resources and you're not going to spend $10 on a little uh, uh, instance of it, right? Well, actually, I ironically, uh, in-memory data grids are very cost competitive because of the fact they run on commodity servers. So you can deploy an in-memory data grid on, in Rackspace or in Amazon or Windows Azure on the, uh, and use the commodity servers that are deployed in the cloud um, and, or on commodity servers on-premise in a department. Uh, and so it's software middleware. This is software technology that runs on commodity servers and commodity networks. Now you get advantages if you can eliminate bottlenecks in the network. That tends to be where the bottleneck is today by using higher speed networks like 10 gigabit or InfiniBand, but you can't just run on standard gigabit. 
No, that's that's pretty cool. So how much how much uh, do you charge? How do you charge for your uh, in-memory well, data grid? Well, yeah, we charge generally by the server or by the equivalent to a server, and we are, we're updating our pricing now, so that's in flux, and we probably uh, need to refer to uh, the right people to talk about the pricing. But it's it's priced uh, uh, in the in a, in a very cost competitively in the, in the range of a few thousand dollars per server. So, uh, and some companies charge a lot more, I might point out, but we believe that this technology being middleware should be competitively priced so it's accessible uh, to uh, deployments that want to add this layer so they can scale out transparently. And so if I was the CTO, how, how do I evaluate this space? Uh, you know, you, you, you named some of the competitors. Uh, yeah. Is it only price, or is there something else that I should be looking well, at? Well, you should definitely be looking at uh, the feature set, and we have driven forward with the feature set from using in-memory data grids for data storage, in-memory storage, to integrating in real-time analytics. So uh, this is the key area in which our company has focused, is integrating real-time analytics. And most recently, we've added in the ability to do Hadoop MapReduce on top of an in-memory data grid. And we can speed up Hadoop MapReduce by orders of magnitude. Uh, in our benchmarks, we've seen 20x in the, in the word count, the standard benchmark. But in a more recent benchmark we did with a, in a financial services application, which I can tell you more about, yeah. uh, we've delivered 40x improvement in performance over the Apache open source MapReduce platform. We have a demo video, yes. if I remember. Well, let right. me set that up for you before yeah. we play it, but yes. Please do. Okay, so uh, a hedge fund needs to manage hedging strategies okay. in different market sectors. And so as a proof of concept for a customer on Wall Street, uh, we implemented um, a strategy analysis platform that was holding thousands of strategies. And for each strategy would hold a set of long positions, equities, and a set of hedging positions. Then those have to be kept in balance so the hedge fund can maintain its position in the market. Now, what happens is during the course of a trading day, a market feed is updating the prices of the equities. And so those positions may get out of balance. And what they need is the ability to alert a trader as quickly as possible when a hedging strategy needs to have its positions altered. You know, some stock sold, some bought. So the way you can do that is with data parallel computing. And what you put in the in-memory data grid is a set of objects, and I, we didn't have time to discuss this, but in-memory data grids take an object-oriented view of data as opposed to a relational view, a database view, because they fit into the business logic layer. Got we can it. come back to that if there's time. But in any case, you store a set of Java objects representing each strategy and holding the positions. Now we can use Hadoop MapReduce to take the market feed, apply it in parallel to all of the strategies, not only update them, but analyze them to see if an alert is needed and feed the alert back to the trader. So we can show that if you want to run the video. Yeah, Rocky. There you go. Okay, so what we're seeing here is the traders platform, the GUI that's available. On the left-hand side are the strategies. Now for the purposes of the proof of concept, we just gave them numbers, but they would represent sectors like automotive, real estate, high tech, and so forth. So you can see them, there are 2,000 in this particular demonstration. And for each strategy, when you click on it, you can see the set of positions, the long and short positions that are being maintained by that strategy. By the way, the yellow strategies are the alerted ones. And then you can see the market prices changing as we're doing MapReduce to update the position's value. And then you can see how the allocations, the percentage of target allocation is varying over time. Now with these are MapReduces run every time that increments, there's a full MapReduce being run. It's taking about 350 milliseconds to do a MapReduce on these 40,000 positions uh, in the 2,000 strategies. At the bottom, you can see standard Apache Hadoop MapReduce taking about 15 seconds to do the same amount of work. So you can see the difference is we can give results in under a second to the trader, and this could be fed to an automatic trading system, whereas standard MapReduce, which is really oriented around offline analysis and batch processing, would deliver results in a much longer period of time. Wow. It's about a 40x speed up, 42. Uh, that's pretty crazy. So you. you can see why uh, f financial institutions want what you do and why uh, e-commerce and other systems that need to keep up to date. Are, are the social networks looking at you? Well, because they're getting quite a bit of feed too, you know? Yes. Well, 500 this, million tweets a day. Absolutely. Now, of course, you know, uh, the social networks, uh, Facebook and Twitter, have a lot of their own homegrown technologies that they have really pushed forward. So, for example, Storm is a, 
um, a stream processing engine that uh, has been designed in order to process things like Twitter streams uh, very quickly. Also, there are projects at Berkeley. There's the Spark project, which is intended to do in-memory computing to accelerate Hadoop MapReduce. And the difference between what we're doing in Spark is that we're focusing on fast-changing live operational data, and not focusing simply on analysis of offline data that you've pulled into memory to accelerate its analysis. Yeah. In addition, of course, Spark has the Shark project, which does SQL query on top of Spark. And so one of the things this technology can be used for is to accelerate SQL query using Hadoop's Hive mechanism or Shark or right. others. This really uh, key building block of, of, of what I wrote about in Age of Context because uh, our, our cars are generating 200, mil, uh, 200 megabytes per second of data right now. Right. Now most of that doesn't go to the cloud yet, but it will, <laughs> yeah. particularly when you get a self-driving right. car, right? We're soon going to have, uh, I don't know, the 150 sensors on us, and that's all going to spit data right. somewhere, right? And, and we're putting more and more data into social networks and location networks. And all that needs to be analyzed in real time to show new kinds of patterns, right? That's right. And you're seeing a confluence growing uh, between in-memory data grid technology and stream processing. Stream processing, like Storm and complex event processing, uh, what the financial services industry uses, for example, IBM Streams, um, these techniques are really looking at a stream of data like you just mentioned and trying to find the patterns in the stream. Where the differentiator between that and what we're doing is we're feeding that data into a very large memory-based data set, updating portions of that data set, and then looking for overall changes in the pattern of usage. So for example, you could use this for credit card fraud detection where you have the history of credit card transactions for users in memory, and then you watch the stream of credit card charges and so you're you're integrating, if you will, both the stream and the history with in-memory data grids. Yeah. Last time I was in uh, eBay's data center, they had a 20,000 node Hadoop cluster. Would you need to change any of that hardware that they've already bought to, to run, or would you be able to put your system in and, and get that kind of performance improvement? Well, what, um, theoretically speaking, we don't deploy on 20,000 nodes today, but mm -hmm. you, we would just deploy directly on that system. What typically happens is the network becomes a bottleneck. And from a practical matter, uh, with gigabit ethernet, you can do intensive computation on tens of servers. With 10 gigabit, you can go to hundreds of servers with, and with InfiniBand. But to uh, run thousands of servers in a single computation, depending on the nature of the computation, the amount of communication, you might need faster networks. Interesting. So we need faster networks. We definitely <laughs> need faster networks, yes. Yeah, they're coming. I, we visited a research lab in uh, Ireland where they're right. doing uh, all sorts of stuff with fiber that's pretty mind-blowing. Where else are, should we be, because uh, I'm not technically enough to really dig in on your technology, and, and, uh, but if, if you were sitting with a CTO of a financial organization, what, what kinds of things would they be interested in talking to you about? Well, I think what people are seeing is there's a big trend in big data you know, that's, yeah. big, that's been evolving for the last five years or so or more. And you know, it really was energized by uh, the emergence of the Hadoop platform and MapReduce before that uh, from Google. Uh, but that represents, really, as I was pointing out in the beginning, it's the, it's the end result of 20, 30 years of development of parallel computing techniques, and it represents the latest uh, incarnation. Now, what we have now is a cadre of MapReduce developers. And w unfortunately, this technology has rarely, if ever, been applied in operational systems. And that's the real opportunity to talk to the CTO about is where in your, um, de your deployments do you have operational systems that need to do real-time analytics fast and can take advantage of data parallel computing. That's where the opportunity lies, is to bring that from the back office into the, not the front office, but the operational side of the house to really drive uh, insights into the data that's changing rapidly. For example, we're working with a, a company that's receiving sensor data from factories around the United States and feeding it into the cloud and then analyzing that, and they're doing both offline an analysis to look at trends to see if machines are likely to fail, but they also want to know if a particular factory machine is going to fail right now, so right. they can take action and prevent loss of product at, in that factory uh, flow. So these are examples of where you not only can use Hadoop, MapReduce, and other data parallel techniques, in the back office, but you can bring it to the operational side. And more and more of this is happening. General Electric is putting sensors, I think 20,000, some, some big right. number on turbines, on jet engines and turbines that they're building. Right. 
Uh, Union Pacific is putting sensors underneath the rails to listen to cars going over, right? That's right. And if you have 100,000 cars, you better be <laughs> doing this data pretty quickly, not not uh, taking days with, with it, right? That's right. I mean, the applications are limitless. Uh, uh, one that uh, we're looking at now is also machine learning. And you know, they're machine learning systems. And, uh, there's a company, Grok Software, which you're probably familiar with, that's doing machine learning on top of MapReduce. And this ability to take streams of data and then use data parallel uh, programming, MapReduce in particular, to, um, to have a system learn about the patterns automatically in the stream of data, that's a big uh, jump forward because of the fact that you no longer have to have the intelligence in your predictive analytics algorithm, but you can let the system itself learn what patterns it should be paying attention to. And that's certainly the next big step forward in many operational applications. Tell me a little bit about your company that you built and oh. how is it funded, how many people oh, work there, and yeah. what kind of people are you are you hiring? And okay, so we're, um, I'm an entrepreneur and I, as I said, it's my fourth company. Um, started this company in um, 2003, we're angel funded through the uh, Seattle uh, Alliance of Angels, of which I'm also a member. So, so like Andy Sachs and that group of people up there? Uh, I don't right. think they're in this particular, I'm, okay. I, I don't want to <laughs> be wrong. But, <laughs> I forget, I, I, I know there's, there's a uh, bunch of people up in Seattle. Now. Yes, uh, so yeah, it's, it came out of the Seattle Technology Alliance and spun out uh, recently. Okay. So it's run by a guy named uh, Dan Rosen, um, who was former Microsoft. Um, and uh, so in any case, uh, we were angel funded in 2004, and we're driving forward uh, you know, with a relatively small team of both .NET experts and Java experts uh, to develop these data parallel software uh, products that we have. So we have about four or five products. Uh, we're based in Seattle and also in Beaverton, Oregon, where our sales uh, take place. And, and so as an entrepreneur, I'm always looking for a confluence of technology trends and where they meet opportunities for small companies emerge. So in this case, it started out with the opportunity uh, to store data using parallel computing techniques. And more recently, the confluence has become uh, doing analytics uh, with memory-based data. So these so the opportunities we look for where there's new technology, so SSDs represent a new technology and its marriage within memory data grid should produce the next generation of, of uh, analytics technology like this. Now it's going to be an interesting future. I, this is why I wrote the book, because I'm trying to identify right. the same kinds of things, and that's why I invited you in. So. Thank you very much. Where do we uh, learn more about you? So you can go to scaleoutsoftware.com, yeah. and you can find us on Facebook and uh, LinkedIn in other places as well. So look forward to uh, people following up and learning more about in-memory data grids and data parallel computing. Very cool, thank you so much. Thank you very much.